People's Platform. Good evening and welcome to the show. My guest tonight is Dr. Pakya Sulti Sarvanamuttu, Executive Director of the Centre for Policy Alternatives. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. South Asia stands at a pivotal juncture as most of its uh, countries goes into election mode, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, as well as Sri Lanka. Uh, let's talk about some of the key challenges, opportunities, implications that we're looking at and how important it is for the government to get out of election mode, get out of doing things for the sake of elections. Well, okay, I mean, in general, as far as South Asia is concerned, if one can generalize the issues, they are the issues of majoritarianism. They are the issues of misgovernance, mm -hmm. <clears throat> of systems of governance not quite working in the way that they're supposed to. And, of course, the big issue of corruption. You know, now in the Sri Lankan context, we have a very unique situation in that we have a president who governs without anyone from his party to support him in parliament. So that is something that he has to navigate, if you like. But he has a very clear understanding of what needs to be done. And he has said, look, I will do the unpopular things. People will call me all sorts of names, but I came to save the economy. That's the ostensible argument that he comes up with. And that's what I'm going to do. However, politicians are politicians. And he can't even know the political realities from the perspective of a politician where, for example, you have a budget mm. whereby the public service is going to get 10 million rupees, uh, 10,000 10, rupees more, each public servant. Yeah. Now, we have a bloated public service. The issue is not giving them 10,000 rupees more. The issue is cutting them down. But can you do that in the run-up to an election? And that's the political calculation that presumably has been made, that you can't do that. Likewise with the military. I don't know what's happening with state-owned enterprises. But the big question, I think, I mean, you know, if the government put a major figure from the past behind bars for corruption, I think that government would be extremely popular. Yeah. But... Doing that is going to make government rather difficult for the current dispensation because the president is from one party, the majority in parliament is from another party, and the suspicion is, of course, is that the members of parliament, the leaders of those parties, particularly the majority party in parliament, are the ones who should be tried for corruption. You know, so there are a number of constraints. Hopefully, they won't put out the getting out of this economic crisis, you know, totally distort it or put it asunder or awry or whatever. Mm. But we have to recognize that none of these things are going to happen fast. Okay. You know, they may well happen, but they're not going to happen fast. Um. From the state responsibility to one of the instrumentalities of the state, the police, uh, it's a constitutionally enshrined right, um, not just in Sri Lanka, but recognize the world over that torture is, freedom from torture is a non-derogable right. Um, however, unfortunately, we keep hearing of instances of people um, being beaten up in prison, arbitrary arrests, people dying in uh, uh, the police. Where's the accountability and how do we go about um, figuring out what's, what's wrong? Well, I think, you know, the accountability does not happen because there are politicians involved and they are blocking any kind of accountability. At the same time, the police, therefore, has got used to the whole question of political patronage. Now, I knew of a time when lots of donor agencies, etc., were doing human rights training of the police force and all of that. But given the number of cases that, as you, as you mentioned, God knows what's happened to that. You know, so you need a root and branch 
reform. I mean, we need a root and branch reform of our social contract. And key to that is the rule of law, equality before the law, the human rights dimensions, and all of that. And what we need to do, I mean, you know, it's a long-term thing. Maybe we could start with the education system and come right up to uh, joining the police force or whatever, but we need to cleanse it of this specter of impunity. Mm. I can do X and Y, and I know I can get off. Impunity is a cancer, not just in the police force, but everywhere. I mean, you know, at CPA, we've done surveys now for over 25 years. What is the most unpopular institution? The police. And the police are meant to be servants and partners of the community at large. But they are seen to be the most unpopular, the most brutish. I'm sure there are thousands of policemen who and women who do their job as they're supposed to, and they get a horrendously bad name as a consequence of this. Mm. So in terms of um, continuous training, uh, what must the state invest in? I mean, how no, do you a start, do this? We, for a start, I mean, we have to have a proper IGP. Right. It's ridiculous that we keep having an acting IGP and that that particular individual is known to be guilty of doing certain things which are total violations of human rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we need to start from the top and then the bottom will also get cleaned up. Because when people come in to join the police force, then they will be educated and informed with the right, with the correct rights. They will know the law. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember as about 10 years ago during the war when I was stopped on, on I think, Torrington Avenue and someone asked me to produce ID card and police this. And I said, what law requires me to do this? Mm. The policeman couldn't tell me. Right. So then we got into a little chat and he said, Oh, Mahatta, you think you have to do it? You think you have to do it? So. So there's a massive gap. Absolutely. As well. Let's talk a bit about the Anti-Terrorism Act in bill form. It was withdrawn by the government a few months ago. Um, the PTA is... It continues to be used to target dissenters. It continues to be used despite uh, undertakings that the government has <coughs> given in Geneva, for example, saying that it won't be used. Absolutely. Um, what do we do? Well, you're right. I think Mangala Sabarvira, when he was foreign minister, he went and he said that we would repeal and replace the PTA and a, a moratorium was offered. And of course, it has never been held. Even the other day, people were being arrested under the, under the PTA. Why that bill was withdrawn, I think, is, is because the PTA comes under the whole GSP framework in that you have to have the ratification of the 27 or 29 odd con human rights and labor conventions. And I think the EU has told the government that the PTA in that form or ATA in that form would still be unacceptable. Mm. So it's being put on the back burner, but obviously it'll come at some point. You see, I think when Ranil Vikramasinghe became president, as I said, as we all know, he had no support in parliament. So he probably expected to have the support of the security apparatus and the armed forces. And they have, it's almost as if all their Christmases have come at, the, at one time. You know, they hoped that Gotabe Rajpaksa would be the strong man who would, you know, look after them and allow them to do whatever. But he proved both to be a coward and incompetent. So when Raya came in and then came down on the Aragale and all of that, I think they were sort of more or less given carte blanche. The Kamal Gunratnas and the Salis and all of that. And that may well continue, but I think something has to be done about it to rein them in because it will be to the political detriment mm. of the government. And I don't think we can wait for an election to resolve that. All right. Uh, we are in conversation with Dr. Pakya Soti Sarvanamuthu. We are going for a short commercial break. We'll be right back.
पीपल्स प्लेटफॉर्म वहाँ क्या मैं तेरे में ये मारो करेटे गिये मारती हूँ दिस इज़ परफेक्ट रात्रि नवयाती है ता सिर्फ सत्यली तिरायन। Budget tells us what we can't afford, but it doesn't keep us from buying it. President Nicholas Singh, as Finance Minister, has delivered this budget under extremely difficult circumstances. The macroeconomic environment is very challenging, tough. And unforgiving. Basically, this is not in relation to increase of taxes. This is not in relation to the reduction of taxes. This budget is all about collection of the taxes. The path forward for 2024 is: Do we are we seeing a sustainable recovery or an unsustainable recovery? Have we learned nothing from our past? When you present budget, it's only uh, um, a passing of faces that you would see. Face the nation Wednesday nights at 9:30 on TV One. core problem mm. that is this economic bankruptcy and the debt problem is still not solved the general public wanted some sort of relief from this budget mr balasurya uh, if prices increase uh, and if the uh, uh, the government can't give any relief mm. uh, the people will get uh, priced out of their existence problems are very complex and you need more than a person and just looking at one individual and thinking that that one one individual can transform the country I, mean, i think we have to get out of that 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 kind of idea sri lanka is now bankrupt professor people are very angry professor governments or the political uh, um, representatives should uh, maintain the public trust face to face News first political talk show Monday to Friday at 8 p.m. on TV1. Inflation, exchange rates and the rise and fall of the stock market bringing you insights into the business world. Watch the business buzz every Tuesday at 9:30 p.m. on TV1. TV One, TV for life. Water cannons fired at female protesters of the NPP who were demanding the government to reduce prices of commodities. <laughs> Sri Lanka cricket files a bribery complaint against former sports minister Roshan Ranasinghe. Rice donated by US aid to uplift the nutrition of school children misappropriated. The government has not put forward a program for debt restructuring, alleges Dr. Harsha De Silva. Dengue cases spike across Sri Lanka. TV1 TV for life. People's Platform. Welcome back to the People's Platform. My guest tonight is Dr. Pakhi Sothi Sarvan Muthu. Uh, Dr. Sarvan Muthu, mourning a loved one, grieving the death of a loved one, uh, memorializing, uh, keeping their memories alive is a right and an important tool in transitional justice. And the state has an important role in driving the process of societal healing and not dividing it further. um this is especially true for the sri lankan context however the ground realities uh say something completely different speak to us about the importance of recognizing how it's important to not exclude multiple narratives how it's important not to marginalize communities who have gone through so much of trauma and hurt in their lives 
Yes, I think, you know, in the Sri Lankan context, I think this stems in large part from the majoritarian ideology that permeates all our society. For example, the JVP can commemorate their dead. Now, one argument might well be that they went through rehabilitation, that Rohan Vijayaviru was allowed to contest a presidential election, and all of that. But at that time, they wanted to overthrow the state by force of arms. Now, if that is the case, if they can commemorate, and here we're talking about private commemorations of my father, my brother, my whatever, who were killed. <coughs> And it's, a, and it's a commemoration of their lives. You know, as long as, and this is where I would have a problem, as long as it is not celebrating death, it must be a commemoration of their life. I think that's what's important, you know. So I, I think that this is just totally unfair. It's a violation of their rights. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so the police and armed forces are... are uh, an extension of the state, um, how must they be advised uh, by the state itself to, to act uh, with sensitivity? So this is why we have to have transitional justice and a policy with regard to reconciliation. The LTT was defeated in 2009. The war ended in 2009. But the conflict continues because of things like that. We should have a proper policy of reconciliation and that should permeate every arm of the state and every agency of the government so that there is a holistic, coherent notion of how we come together as a country. So if that happens, then the police would be given instructions in terms of what they are to permit and what they are not to permit, how they are to behave when they have reasonable, legitimate grounds to take someone into custody, how they should treat them. You know, there cannot be neglect and impunity. There are acts of omission and there are acts of commission and neither should be allowed to go without accountability. If we are a democratic society, we have to have transparency and accountability. We can't shove things under the carpet. In terms of transitional justice, the government has um, uh, taken measures in terms of um, appointing of uh, commissions like the LLRC, uh, the Parnagama Commission, uh, which were ad hoc measures, and then the per more permanent measures of the uh, Office for Reparations, um, Office on Missing Persons, and then uh, there is talk of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Are you saying that these are just piecemeal efforts or yes i don't think i i don't think it that they form parts of a coherent whole and furthermore are they being given the prominence that they deserve are they being given the proper resources has there been sufficient consultation for example with the people the families of the victims etc who <coughs> on the trc for example we heard about the TRC when the Rajpaksas were in power and the principal purpose of that was, you know, talking about amnesty. You know, so we need proper consultation. Now, I was the secretary of the uh, task force on the four mechanisms and the people that we talked to, what they first wanted to know, the truth, the acknowledgement of the truth by the state and whoever else did these atrocities. That has not happened. Secondly, if there were to be mechanisms, they wanted to be part of those mechanisms. That they operated in a language that they understood and spoke, that they operated in areas where they lived. Is any of that happening? And if certain things, and of course, Office of Missing Persons, you will have to have certain technical expertise and all of that, and that would take time. But that should be explained to them. There should be a proper conversation with them. They can't sit in Colombo in a ministry and expect those people to come to them. They should go out to them. Yeah. That's not happening. So what's the way forward in terms of transitional justice, meaningful? Well, 
Well, the way forward to transitional justice, there are a number of things that can be done with regard to transitional justice. I mean, I'll give you one example. It may at one level seem insignificant or relatively trivial, but nevertheless it has a resonance long, uh, all over the country. Why on earth do we play our national anthem only in singular? Just play it without any singing. If you do not want one verse to be sung in Sinhala, one verse to be sung in Tamil. There are countries where the national anthem is sung in five languages. So that's one thing that they can do. In 1990, there is an official languages commission that was set up to make sure that the recognition of Tamil also as an official language was made into law and laws and all of that were done in Tamil. We work outside the pro in the provinces and we find that with certain local government institutions there are no local laws in Tamil. Now we can translate it but that won't be an official translation. Hmm. You could start off by doing things like that whereby people feel that what they encounter in their everyday lives reinforces the notion that they are equal citizens, not that they are marginalized. You know, and then, of course, all the commissions and all of that, you have to have a good look at appointing the right people and giving them the sufficient resources to make a difference. Mm. How do we connect all of this with the policy makers? Are they competent enough? Are they, do they care enough to bring no, I, in these changes? No, I don't think they care enough. They probably do one or two things in order to attract votes uh, to get elected to government. But that is why we need a tr new political culture that recognizes the importance of things like that. We need structural reform as far as the economy is concerned. We need transitional justice. We need constitutional reform. We need a new constitution. Our social contract is in pieces. And corruption is one thing. You know, I think government will be extremely popular if they put a big wig behind bars for corruption. I mean, look at what happened in Malaysia. Dr. Sarvan Muthu, for m the most part of your life, you've been advocating for governance reform, constitutional reform, transitional justice, uh, all of these things. But we're still having these conversations. Yes, <clears throat> because nothing happens overnight and nothing happens in a straight line. Again, I come back to 2015. In 2015, the government that was elected was elected basically on a platform that was defined and designed by civil society over 20 years. Right. But the personalities of the politicians or whatever it was didn't gel and the whole thing fell apart. But we got there so that the public has some idea and I would say those were the seeds of the Aragalia as well. Okay. Part of the seeds of the Aragalia, whereby the public knew that there are ways in which to reform the system and the system had to be reformed. That there was a reform agenda that had to be implemented. Well, Aragalia didn't succeed in coming up with the systemic change, but they got one family out of government. Yeah. So it's a long process. And it is not a linear progression. Furthermore, we also need to attack it at its roots. And that is also in the schools and the education system. I mean, you know, people talk about STEM education, science, technology, economics, mathematics. Now, I say to you, those are tools. Those are tools. But how do you educate a person to be a citizen of a functioning democracy? STEM education is about the how. What I'm talking about is the what and the why. Mm. And those are the overarching questions. I mean, as far as I know, I don't think history in this country, in terms of, say, political history, is taught beyond 1978. And we do know that we had a time when, say, Tamil children were so, yeah, you learned that in school, you come back home, we'll tell you the real history. <laughs> we also know, for example, that 
there are about 300,000 people who've gone out between the ages of what, 20 and 45 or whatever, because the grass is greener on the other side. Some of them have taken jobs, I'm told, below the qualifications that they have because they can't pass the language test. Right. I mean, this is criminal. Yeah. We need to focus on English. One point, what, whatever billion Chinese are learning English. The largest store of English graduates is in India. And what are we doing? Mm. Yesterday I was having a conversation with someone who said that, you know, her maid sister has got good marks and she wants to go into university. And when she was asked what she wants to go into university to learn, she said, Pali. <laughs> right. So we have to have a complete attitudinal change. And there is, I mean, let's face it, there is a culture of entitlement. <clears throat> free education, free health, at least on paper, and a job in the public service. No one look, you're looked after from womb to tomb. Mm. What is the incentive to do anything else? We're frogs in a well. So they carry their briefcase, even though they're personal aides and they probably sit at their desk and sleep most of the time. They carry their briefcase and say, Abhi, Abhi Raja Sevian, Radhikaran. All of that has to change. What's the responsibility that vests in the citizen to educate themselves? Every responsibility. At the end of the day, in a democracy, we have to blame ourselves for the government that we get. Because we put them there. And the other point is this. The politicians don't fall from the sky or crawl out from under a stone. They're us. They're us. If we don't have those values, if we don't prize that integrity, mm. if we don't believe that impunity has to be attacked, that accountability has to be the name of the day or the game of the day or whatever, then we're lost. We, in a democracy, we have to take the responsibility for it and it's internal vigilance. There is, I think it was Montesquieu or someone who said that there is nothing worse than the apathy of the ordinary citizen. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Fakisoti Saramutu. Thank you for your service. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for watching us. We'll see you again tomorrow. Good night.